Hi, I'm Robert Wright. I run the Non-Zero Foundation, which produces all the shows on Blogging Heads TV and Meaning of Life TV. We host a variety of voices, some of them pretty unorthodox, and we encourage dialogue that is sharp but civil. We think fostering constructive conversation is especially important now that America and the world are looking kind of fragile. If you agree that our mission is important, I hope you'll consider helping us shoulder the cost. You can do that by becoming one of our cherished patrons at patreon.com slash nonzero foundation. That's N-O-N-Z-E-R-O-F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N. Thanks. We need your help, and we deeply appreciate it. Hi, I'm Kat Rosenfield. I'm Phoebe maltz Bovey. We are Feminine Chaos. Hello. Welcome. Yes. Welcome to our Blogging Heads show. Um, so, then, Oh, please join us also, though. Please join us also on, show. on Patreon, where you can subscribe uh, at multiple tiers and get exclusive content, which so, some of which is somewhat relevant to what we're talking about today. So our topic uh, today is the youth or the youth, the youths, as uh, Joe Pesci would say. And um, we're going to start by touching on a few points related to what I like to call the mere child discourse. And that's something we've sort of talked about um, in a previous episode as it relates to Me Too. But today we're going to talk about some interesting developments in the mere child discourse. Um, however, we're not going to do the entirety of our conversation here um, right around the time that we kick over to the topic of Aaron Coleman, who is or was a mere child when he did revenge porn on his female classmates. We're also going to go over to Patreon and have that conversation for subscribers. So if you And want- we're going to debate it. Possibly, yeah. We, are. yeah, we might yeah. fight. We yeah, might fight. <laughs> definitely. You know, an audio-only mud pit across the border that has not yet opened between the U.S. and Canada. Right. The mud is metaphorical or not. You don't know. It's audio only. Like maybe there will be. I don't. I feel like departments of agriculture would not approve of throwing mud um, internationally. It probably depends on whether or not it's infested with weevils. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> But either way, if you enjoy this conversation and you want to hear an extended, um, perhaps even more candid version, you can join us over on patreon.com slash feminine chaos at the $5 a a month tier or the larger one, which will also get you the exclusive content. And uh, we hope you will. So with that said, (laughs) (laughs) so uh, so we discuss youth as I noticed that it is... um, as you can probably see, evening as we record, and I am like slowly falling asleep. No, I'm not asleep, but it's <laughs> my old age is showing. Um, but wow. but we could talk about about the young people. Um, so I'm going to just start by saying something very silly and unrelated to any of our serious pre-planned topics about uh, youth. But I feel like I start wearing a lot of teenager clothing during the pandemic. I don't know whether it's that there are a lot of teenagers in my neighborhood or that it doesn't really matter what you wear, or if I'm just feeling nostalgic for um, the way before times, like not just before coronavirus, but before like anything was difficult in my own world or something. And like dressing as if I'm like 12 or 14 or something. Is is your current outfit what we would describe? No, this as... is my current outfit is because we had soil delivered and I had to like get dressed very quickly, but that's a long story. <laughs> you had to be very um, quick together to meet the soil delivery. This is basically a very big t-shirt. Um, it may look more professional than that, but yeah, no, in general though, like I'm very drawn to clothing that I realize is probably not even like for a 16 year old, but it's probably for like a 12 year old, but it's just like, nice clothing mm. but not like in sizes for a 12 year I mean like stuff that'll fit me hopefully. right right but, yeah well I mean I think that's reasonable I actually not not recently but a couple of years ago um 
decided to recreate in adulthood my favorite outfit from when I was um, three, which was oh wow, <laughs> it was a blue hooded sweatshirt and a pair of purple corduroy pants. And uh, that sounds nice. Believe it or not, this is still a thing that one can wear as a thirty something woman. Um, and it even looks pretty chic. So yeah, you know, I, I think that I, I support you in your teen. But would you, even if you knew that, so this is not even teen now that you mention it, one of the garments I'm thinking of might be what teenagers are wearing now, but I loved a very similar thing I owned, um, probably also in the three ish realm, pink just, bike shorts. Oh, oh, you've gotten on the bike shorts train. Well, yes and no. I think they don't look great, to be honest. Like, but this that's is the like, that's era like, when you can't try they, things on, and they, they just, don't look good like, on anybody. I know, mean, but like they they really they would look better in a size that fit me than the size um, that I internet guest might fit me and would fit an actual well, smaller or younger or whatever person. The lesson here is that fashion is cyclical. Cyclical. Cyclical, I, th- I think. I don't know. Cycle shorts um, <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> and it is. It certainly with, is. With that in mind, I mean, I mean, I've been wearing the same pair of sweatpants since March, so whatever. And they're probably they've probably come in and out of fashion several times since. Yes, I think that's very true. So, so you wrote a great piece for Tablet. Cat wrote you. a great piece for Tablet that I really enjoyed, and I just reread and really enjoyed again. Um, called is it young love am i imagining this yes it is yeah that, young that love is, that i can't take credit that was uh, all about the editorial staff at tablet who are lovely people um but yeah you know we've been talking about this sort of this notion of people approaching middle age getting to claim that they're sort of still of the youth and we've talked about that a little bit in the context of me too and the sort of um i, I can't remember the name of the person who claimed this, but it, she said that she had been a wide-eyed 26-year-old at the time. That, yes, we have discussed the wide-eyed 26-year-old. I remember um, that it was like a writer she admired, but I don't really remember anything else about the story. Right. So I think, you know, like wide-eyed 26-year-old, I don't know, put that on my tombstone. But, um, it, you know, that was a memorable aspect. And yet, the, this notion that people are, you know, too young to know better right up until, I mean, basically they're 40, um, has developed into, it's become an interesting kind of like spectrum of things because at the same time as you have, um, legit full adults claiming this sort of youthful ignorance, you also have actual children, um, being told like, no, youth is no excuse. It doesn't matter that you were 12 or nine or that you're still not even an adult. Like if, you know, you, you should know better. There's no excuse for you not have, having educated yourself about this. Um, so the thing that kind of prompted me to start writing about this was this incident in New York city. And it dates back to the protests um, on the evening of May 29th, 2020, when two lawyers now kind of notoriously threw a Molotov cocktail into a police car. And there was this incredible piece on the cut, um, incredible in a number of ways, because it was, you know, a very interesting and riveting piece of journalism, but it also took this kind of bizarre tone. And, you know, it, it was very heavily focused on like, who were these lawyers who are now both in their early thirties? Like who were they as teenagers? Um, there's this great line suggesting that they were just like too young and too idealistic to not throw an incendiary device into a cop car, despite having gone to law school. And then the response to it um, was very also kind of of that ilk. There was this one really viral tweet where um, this, this man described them as like two quote young and idealistic lawyers. And he described the Molotov cocktail throwing as a moment of madness and said that they just got caught up in the black lives matter movement, which I think is, you know, like offensive to everybody, including the black lives matter movement. Anyway, 
So all this was happening at the same time as you have actual teenagers basically being kind of perma canceled for being racist or for having posted racist stuff online, sometimes when they were tweens or even younger teenagers. Um, there are a lot of interesting examples of this, but my favorite is Maddie Ziegler of, um, I guess, formerly Dance Moms, and then she was in a bunch of music videos. She's like a professional dancer. And she used to do a like objectively offensive impression of a um, Chinese food takeout restaurant worker on video when she was about nine years old, but she um, had to apologize for this. The videos resurfaced and she had to apologize. She's like 17 now and people were like, you should have known better. <laughs> There's no excuse. You were nine, but you she know, was nine. Yeah. Hmm. That's weird. So uh, yeah, so that's, you know, how I kind of landed on this topic. And well, it's, it's fantastic as a, as a topic, and you treated it really interestingly and well. Um, it, it's, I had never thought about it like this before in terms of because we talked that yeah, definitely about that whole um, the Me Too notion of like the eternal girl and all of that. But like, mm-hmm. yeah, it is bizarre. And I've been trying to make sense of like, how that could possibly be consistent. Because it's not. At the same time, I wonder, like, if it has something to do with, like, you're saying, like, this notion of the children as, like, this whole sort of, like, Gen Z will save us kind of approach, whether it's that, like, whether that's both why there's this kind of, like, grasping at youth from older people and this sort of, like, holding actual youth to impossible standards, like, if Gen Z is like the most pure thing ever then like how could a child ever have done anything offensive when that generation is like progress you know like I almost wonder if it's that yeah yeah I mean I think that there that is an element of it and the other thing is that being getting to call yourself young or naive or whatever um it doesn't really seem to correlate so much anymore to necessarily being actually young no um because there's this notion that it's like a protected class um sort of in the way that um like some so you you have like spaces on the left where people are very big on deferring to people of color right and it's like you know listen to black voices this and that but if you have a dissenting voice from that community then there is this sort of implicit or sometimes explicit suggestion that that person isn't really black or isn't really whatever, you know, they don't really get to speak for the community that they're ostensibly a part of because they're not on the right side politically. They're not saying the right things. And I think that maybe you see that a little bit playing out when it comes to who gets to call themselves a kid and who doesn't. Mm, That's interesting. I mean, there, yeah, I guess, yeah, I think there's almost like this sort of like, it's unfathomable that a young person wouldn't be like so righteous and then they don't even have to fall all that short of so righteous to be like condemned in the yeah I guess yeah yeah there was that woman who wrote this thing about how her sons were watching like you like YouTube video comedy right and oh was, gosh like, yes wasn't was, that something it- Right. Am I imagining this? No, it was. It was a, this a, was somebody, a, right? a tweet storm that became a New York Times column. Right, right, right. That lady. Yeah. yeah we, we were both really not happy about that at the time. And it was, um, no. it, it, I mean, yeah, like a similar, oh gosh, excuse me, a similar thing where you had this suggestion that it didn't matter that they were young and it didn't matter that they might be attracted to this because it was irreverent uh, or iconoclastic that, you know, clearly they were being radicalized. And I mean, that was a fascinating example of a woman kind of throwing her own children, like a middle-aged woman throwing her own Mm -hmm. children under the bus. Which happens a lot. I should say that a lot of parenting writing is of the bus throwing variety. And that is its own whole sort of ongoing problem with onlineness. But yeah, I mean, I I guess something that I, I think maybe part of the problem is with this specifically though is once it got decided that the youth of today like don't do irony are all about like 
like, like the, I guess it, I almost think it's a date like to the, to the Parkland thing, right? Mm-hmm. And to Greta, not Greta Gerwig, the other one. Greta, Greta Thunberg. Thank you. Yeah. The, um, how da- the how dare you girl, not the, um, you know, Francis Ha woman. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. Just that like, obviously young people are, you know, people and some will be very earnest and some won't. And it's like the, the culture decided what they're like before they even got to sort of assert it. And then when they act in any way that's unexpected, it's like, but, but we already typecast you as that you're all, you know, obsessed with saving the environment and solving racism and sexism. And you all, you know, like you would never, any of you joke about anything offensive because you're also pure and, but they're kids though. And why would they be different from kids of any other generation? Yeah. That that's, that's a funny thing is this notion of like the youth are so young and unspoiled and they will save us. And I mean, you can see this kind of playing out in the, I mean, basically fawning coverage of kids who kind of go social justice vigilante on their classmates and start forming these, like, they start making these Google documents to kind of um, corral lists, anonymous lists, which are always a great idea, of um, people who are allegedly racist. And is it other isms, too, or is it just racism? Is, Is that... I feel like it's mostly racism. Hmm. Um, I mean, obviously there was the shitty media men list, which was sort of the original. Um, and I don't mm-hmm. know if maybe it's the, you know, nobody wants to, you know, to do what was already done so well. Again, mm-hmm. it's too early yeah. for a sequel to the shitty <laughs> media men list. Um, but even uh, shittier part two, <laughs> yeah, son of shitty media man. <laughs> this time it's personal. <laughs> But no, I, I mean, I think also there's something to the fact that, I mean, being accused of racism is kind of the most damaging thing um, that a person can have levied against them. Well, this week. Okay, so that's something that I think is kind of, that's something this, I've just been like. This year. <laughs> but yeah. This, I don't know. I just think there's something very, I know I'm. I'm not the first to say this at all but the whole thing where there's like the thing people care about this minute and then the thing people, like I was listening to a, I tweeted about this recently but that I was listening to a food podcast um with a, it's a white man is the host I'm not obviously like this does not particularly narrow it down necessarily with a white man has a podcast I know <laughs> it's a the, food the podcast, podcast by the white guy um anyway where they've been on this podcast covering um i guess they're they're like really both covering but like really promoting old things that they did where like where they either interviewed somebody black or talked about race and racism um and he's just saying that kind of chipper podcast way like you might like our content on you know like slavery and you know like like <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but it's just kind of- <laughs> like, I don't know. It's just like, but he's super earnest and like, he's fighting the good fight, you know, like he's definitely on the side of social justice and all of this, but like, there was just something about it where it's like, got to get those clicks though, <laughs> or downloads or whatever. And it was like, I don't know. There was just something so like, I don't know how, like, it's going to be about racism until it's about whatever it is next. And it's like the, cyclical trends like you say right well i mean to return to the youth um kind of topic i think that maybe also part of it is that obviously we're at a hell of a moment in american history you know we've got civil unrest likes of which hasn't been seen in half a century and there's a huge election coming up and you know everybody wants to be a revolutionary but being a revolutionary is kind of something it's like a young person's game. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, something that I started kind of, I fell down a little bit of a rabbit hole writing this piece for tablet, um, watched a documentary about the weather underground who to my mind, I mean, I only know these people now as like Berkeley professors or, or whatever, you know, they're, they're like 70 year old, um, kind of heroes of the progressive movement. And you sort of forget that they bombed a bunch of buildings back in the seventies, but they were really, really young then. And, you know, I got sort of interested in 
the youth aspect of this. It was like a sort of a similar thing. It was, it was almost, I mean, not cute, but some people clearly thought it was, you know, that there were these young people speaking truth to power in the form of blowing up government buildings. Um, but then they all eventually kind of disbanded and started training themselves in. And, um, uh, I've completely forgotten her name and the name of the other guy I want to mention. So sorry about that. I don't have time to look it up, but, um, the sort of leader of the movement ended up, um, giving herself up to the police because, well, for one thing, they had, they had forgiven basically, you know, they sort of vowed that they weren't going to be prosecuted. So it was basically safe to do so, but she had kids. She'd gotten married to, um, another person in the weather underground they had children the children were starting to notice that like they weren't allowed to socialize nobody was ever allowed to come over to their house and so like in this very kind of adult moment you know there was a decision made like okay i'm gonna stop living as like a fugitive because it's bad for my little boy and then um similarly this other guy who who gave himself up um before he did he wrote a letter to his father saying like you know, I'm, I'm older now. And of course he was like 30, but it was like, I can't get a job. You know, I don't have any work history. Nobody wants to hire me. And once he turned himself in, he didn't make a comment, but his father spoke to the press and was like, you get too old to be a revolutionary. You got to do something else. And that kind of struck me. It's like, you know, but everybody wants to be a revolutionary right now. And if being revolutionary requires being young, then everyone's just going to try to kind of appropriate youth so that they can mm-hmm. be a part of this. They can feel like they're a part of this moment. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. And oh, so much on this, where even to begin? Um, <laughs> I mean, this is something that came up. Well, so actually, I did write about something vaguely related to this for Arc Digital when I wrote about, um, what's it called? The baby shops that have like the woke baby. Oh, the woke baby stuff. That was such a great piece. Well, thank you. Yeah. I don't yeah, remember if we talked about it or not, but it's a $60 onesie next right, right, to right. the anti-racist yes. baby book. Yes. So basically, um, I think what happens is once people, especially once people have children, there becomes this whole, um, it's not only about children, although I, I think it, is in many ways that's the kind of extreme case where basically um commonplace but extreme where people who have these notions of you know social justice and everything should be fair suddenly have these people they want the best for and that's their children and how can you simultaneously want the best for your children and think that everybody should have you know that the playing field should be 100% equal Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the way this seems to be dealt with in a lot of cities is via like live in a, you know, good school district, but buy the right, you know, board books for your baby that say, you know, woke baby or whatever (laughs) on them. Um, But yeah, I think that like this was something that came up, though, a lot when I was um, writing about uh, privilege discourse that like saying that you, you know, renounce all your privilege when you're 19 is very different from saying this when you're, you know, like when you have bills, you know, like in a more meaningful sense. And yeah, I mean, I think this is, this was true decades ago and continues to be true. I mean, like there's, there's being young and there's being radical. And I think people sometimes like confuse life stage with like permanent politics, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Well, I mean, I just want to read aloud now the the one the this one quote from the piece about the Molotov cocktail throwing lawyers. Go for it. Says, it. To be a lawyer is to agree to play by the rules, or at least to acknowledge that the rules exist, even as you seek to bend them. And it is this simplistic, romantic understanding of a lawyer's job that is part of what has the government so provoked. The government, in this case, being the you know prosecutors who are trying to send these people to prison for 45 years. Um, This is my favorite part. As if going to law school is or should be a safeguard against breaking the law. And the as if just (laughs) kills me as a member of the clueless generation. Yeah, I was going to say, I hear it in in Cher's Uh, voice. As if, (laughs) you know, going to law school should be a safeguard against breaking the law. But like, shouldn't it 
be <laughs> possibly? I mean, do you really, I mean, leaving aside the jokes from Breaking Bad about how you don't want a criminal lawyer, you want a criminal lawyer. I mean, you don't actually want your lawyer to commit crimes, probably. Yeah, I don't know. It's the youth thing is so weird there, though, like to be out of I, I think it has a lot to do. Yeah, like you wrote, like with the economy and with if you're sort of precarious in the same way into your 30s that would be kind of associated with youth. It's like that can just make it seem weird not to keep calling yourself young, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, feel old from coronavirus. Not I have not had, <laughs> thankfully, to my knowledge, the coronavirus, but just like this time of lockdown. Experience is making you feel old. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Or it's yeah. getting old. Maybe it's just getting old. <laughs> right? It's, it. been, it's been 84 years. Um, it has, though. In quarantine. But no, I so, mean... But, I, oh, we should, we should return, though, to the topic of the people who are um, outing their shitty media men except not shitty media men the lists shitty, list of shitty, the shitty viral spreading men and women okay <laughs> yeah so just to like segue yeah the, to so segue smoothly. maybe we're segueing um, very very smoothly um, <laughs> to the topic of slightly older or younger depending which group we're talking about people college students college students um who not only were sometimes racist in their youth but also why else are college students problematic these days apparently they won't stop partying so a a group of people who had been living at home until very recently go to college to residential colleges that require them or expect them to show up in person to live for the first time ever often without you know any adults supervising them they can do whatever they want and nobody's watching them. Lo and behold, you wouldn't, the last thing anybody would expect, they party and they have sex and they interact with one another and they don't all just like sit in their rooms and like read their readings and PDFs on their computers. Isn't that surprising? I, for one, am shocked. Shocked to discover that college students are socializing. I mean, they're socializing with each other in, in college. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not what it's for. How goddamn dare they? Um, oh, so this, the, there was a New York Times article, um, and I have a tab open, I think, about this, um, and apparently an Instagram picture of dachshunds, but let me shut that down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, are the dachshunds social distancing? Are they wearing masks? Oh, they're definitely all clustered together, but it's very sweet. And they're in Japan. Um, it's called Stop Campus Partying to Slow the Virus. Colleges try, but often fail. Um, and but it's by Sean Hubler and Anemona Hartopoulos. Um, basically, the college students have been at, like, they've been told that, you know, college is happening because the schools need tuition, basically. Um but then they're not allowed to like face to face interact. And I do not understand how that's supposed to work. Like even just like logistically, how are you supposed to be alone? Well, they signed an, they signed a promise. They signed a little honor promise. Um, and it's like those forms they used to make teenagers sign about or like whatever, like a purity, purity pledges. Pledge, right? Yes, exactly. I, yes, I, I solemnly swear I will not have premarital sex. Like, so help me God. And then you turn around and a second later, of course, you know, it's all forgotten. I mean, it's, it's even more ridiculous because this is like, I won't have friends. In college. Yes. Like, who's gonna even be like, that just, it almost seems, I almost want to, I'm going to be really hyperbolic about this and <laughs> lean into this. It seems like it's a human rights violation, a Geneva Convention. But seriously, like, to be, think how isolated you'd be in college if you couldn't have any, you know, you're alone suddenly. And like, you're basically not allowed to interact in the ways that you make friends in college. Yes. How else do you make friends if you can't socialize? I mean, I, I don't know. When I was in college, I was not on like an app to make friends. I would go out and yeah. talk no, to people. I mean- like this idea that, you know, I mean, the kids are going to go to a residential school and be in dorms, but also treat it like 
I don't know, like a little learning pod that they go, that they go into, like they go to bed to sleep and then they like emerge from their little pod to go to class pod to learn. And they go back from their little class pod to their bed pod and go back to sleep. I mean, that was it never- makes no sense. It like truly, truly, truly could not make less sense. I think, I don't <laughs> think it's impossible for people that age to be socially distanced I guess although it, this indefinite aspect thing is a little bit its own question and but oh okay well it's not just that like if you are say you know the age of 18 and you've been paying any kind of attention to the news over the past six months mm-hmm. um yes you've seen a lot of calamity calling about coronavirus you've also seen extremely flattering supportive coverage of people out crowded together not socially distanced often not wearing masks dancing together at these protests and i really do think that like i mean you want to talk about the effects of like public health officials kind of squandering their public trust, um, mm. you know, making it difficult to know what's real and what's not. This is probably a good example of that. You know, you can look at, um, say, an outdoor. Again, this is this is the thing. Is like a lot of the stuff in this um, in this article is like, oh, students were sitting on porches not mm-hmm. socially distanced. And it's like, okay, well, you know, you have people marching in the streets, not socially distanced. Oh, either. oh, the indoor outdoor aspect, I think is super interesting. And also when you yeah. tie it together with the U S drinking age being 21, which automatically drives a lot of drinking indoors. Um, yes. Generally, I wonder how much of a factor that would be specifically in the States because, um, you know, <laughs> like my, memory of college was that there was definitely drinking that did not particularly start at 21 and it had to be kind of not always physically indoors but it had to be you know it it, could, it was going to be on a big patio like at a bar you know right because that wasn't possible for most of the students in undergrad I guess it depends it's probably pretty regional <laughs> but I mean, where every, every, everywhere right now is going to be like comfortable enough to be outdoors, right? That's but, true. It's only slightly chilly now in Toronto sometimes. Mm. It's not that cold yet. Um, and then in the States. But I just mean like, I guess maybe the more like moderate weather, this will come up. Maybe it's irrelevant, <laughs> but I just, maybe I'm just, I don't think 21 drinking age makes any sense. And maybe I'm just totally gratuitously adding that to the conversation but no I think we're, we're in agreement on that we're not gonna <laughs> fight about it but yeah uh, no mud pit necessary for this um although maybe there are mud pits at these colleges but as long as they're outdoors and socially distanced mud pits um then it's fine yeah I don't know this just this drives me nuts this story about these poor students who you know they're being asked to do something that makes absolutely no sense and and then they're punished and they're like expelled and they're asked to like um, snoop on one another. Yeah, and, their like, peers and forming on them. Yeah. And then these poor RAs. Who oh, yeah. Like, oh, that was the focus of the time story. And it was so depressing. Yeah. Being dispatched to like, you know, act as enforcers and they're not even being paid anything extra. You know, I mean, I don't know. It's when I think about what it was like for me in college and what a ghastly job my RA had just trying to keep people from like not taking a dump in the hallways or not like (laughs) tearing down like her cute little holiday things that she would make and put on the bulletin board and you know and like I mean we had we had a floor meeting about that she she you know called us out and she was like somebody took down my construction paper butterflies and but that was really hurtful. Um, I spent a lot of time on those and I did it for you and, and somebody just ripped them down and everyone was like, Oh, that's really sad. Like we feel so terrible, even though nobody admitted to having done it. It wasn't me. I just want to say, um, but yeah, like the idea that, you know, we're going from that to trying to dispatch the same age students to be like, the quarantine police. It just, it's also terrible. I mean, this, I guess I just, what I keep returning to with this whole era we're in this moment, this eternal moment um, is just, yeah, it's easy if you're kind of settled in life in a certain, I don't want to say it's easy. It's terrible. It's terrible at any point, but like 
at a certain part, and there's a certain part of your life where meeting new people is like central to what you're doing. That's central to your life. It's central to your development, whatever. There are various stages in life. I mean, frankly, like it upsets me that, you know, when I take my toddler to a playground, it's like, I feel like I'm doing something vaguely wrong, even though like they're technically reopened, you know, Mm -hmm. but like that, like being a child, but also I would say college, I mean, you're supposed to be like networking. You're supposed to be finding maybe your spouse, all these things that are supposed to be happening. And you're just supposed to be having fun and making friends and all of that and learning. But like, truly, like you are going to have different, you know, a whole different life. If you can't actually like make friends in college, it's not just about the classes you know, mm-hmm. and there's just something so cruel about telling people to show up but not interact that I find very, um, unless I'm imagining it and it's like they're allowed to have friends and interact or just not allowed to like have a very specific type of party. But I don't think so because like, technically they're never supposed to be having any parties and always are. I mean, it's so basically. specifically they're supposed to be self-isolating. And oh, I mean, that's you know, so nuts. That's, you've got to be oh. so homesick. It's like, you know, you. It's so depressing. Yeah, exactly. And then I think that could cause a whole mental health crisis beyond because, you know, the students who don't socialize at the beginning are often very upset, you know? Yeah. And then that's forcing that onto the whole student population. That's just. Oh, like, that's just true. don't. If you can't reopen them uh, properly, like don't do it. But if you can just do it. I don't know. Cynically, it seems like what happened was a lot of colleges waited until like tuition dollars were in like, Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to fully reopen. We're going to fully reopen. And whoops, we have your tuition dollars. We've changed our minds. But I mean, of course you also have these situations where people, where kids are showing up and there is this massive spike in cases and it's clearly fueled by, you know, the, the youth, yeah, you know, not following guidelines. And that's unfortunate. Um, but I don't know, it does. Yeah, it does seem unfair, basically. Well, it's also I mean, I think it's an unfair situation in a bigger, not bigger, but like in a broader sense, too, because like, why is the tuition so expensive? Well, part of it is that they're basically asking faculty to figure out this online teaching thing mm-hmm. suddenly. And it's not obvious how that's supposed to be done and it's not like college is suddenly cheaper to administer it's if anything probably more expensive to administer but the product is also worse so it's this kind of big mess um I just feel very grateful to not be in college right now I can't imagine like and I started like right after 9-11 you know, it wasn't exactly like a calm time. And I had been, you know, in Manhattan when that happened, I was not at all like calm about things at that time. But like, this seems so much more dramatic, because it's just this indefinite thing that's so directly day to day impacts every single person. I don't know. It's, yeah. I I feel for the college students and Mm. I really, I I can't imagine somebody having like on their record, whatever, like expelled or suspended for like making friends while being 18 years old, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, the saddest thing to me is the cat comes to interrupt everything. Um, is this this girl who's kind of demonized in the piece, you know, who was caught, leaving her room after she oh, right, been, right, after she been after she'd been warned that she needed to isolate and all i could think was like you know the ra the ra sees her and is like what are you doing and it's like she you know, she's probably like so desperate for human contact like this ra who's you know who's yelling at her to go back in her room is probably the only human being she's seen <laughs> in like, yeah. you know since she since she got to school and there's something truly sad about that yes it's it's very sad um shall we segue to one other sad young person as a little hint of what's to come on a patreon are we talking about the politician in kansas we certainly are Ooh, yes uh aaron coleman whose Hmm. saga will not end i thought it was over 
not over. Keeps um, going. Yeah. So um, for he's so people, young, it could keep going for well past w- our lifespan. After, long after we are both dead. Yes, it could keep going. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. So for those not in the know, Aaron Coleman is the 19-year-old uh, candidate for the Kansas State Legislature who won his primary against a seven-year incumbent. Um, I think he was the only other person on the ballot, managed to eke out this win. Um, then it became suddenly national news, not that he had won, but that when he was in middle school, between the ages of 12 and 14, he mistreated his female classmates very badly, including, and this is sort of the main focus, um, when he was 12, he did revenge porn. He obtained a picture, a nude photo of a With a blackmail. Male. There yeah. was blackmail he, involved. He obtained a nude photo of a 13-year-old girl. Um, he contacted her and said, give me more nude photos or I'll publish the one that I already have. She wouldn't give him more. And so he, you know, sent it to everyone. Um, to, the cat's like, don't say it. I stick my tail in your mouth. Um, so, yeah, you know, this happened and it became a major news story as – People not in Kansas began to fiercely debate whether Aaron Coleman should, quote unquote, get to. Wait, is Glenn Greenwald not in Kansas? I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. I don't don't, forget where he is, but I I, I don't think a single person who weighed in on this story, I mean, including myself, is actually. I'm going to just go out. I'm going to just throw it out. I have never been to Kansas. I haven't either. I've been around that region. I have just not been to that particular state. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure it's lovely. Um, but, you know, I, whatever. As an American, I reserve the right to talk about Kansas. <laughs> um, and Is Toronto Midwestern? Wait a second. I mean, I'm very near Michigan. I feel like I have I mean, sort of, geographically. Geographically, yes. But, but in, culturally. In, ter- in terms of cultural character, I think probably not. No, it's um, but, sort of in the middle nice of the Atlantic try. Ocean. It's in the middle of the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean, like between New York and London. and some right. yeah. Um, But yeah, so, you know, this became a huge topic of conversation because, you know, being as these offenses were committed when he was very young, and this was prior to additional information coming out that maybe these offenses or offenses of this type um, like the misogynistic type had continued into his early adulthood. Mm, but wait, but, sorry, one quick timing question. When mm, was it that he said that like the past is the past? Let's leave it in the past. So that's an interesting question. And I think that's, that's one that we're going to talk about ooh, on Patreon. Ooh. So suffice to say the Aaron Coleman case is a fascinating example of when does a kid get to claim I was just a kid. You know, when do we hold these offenses against somebody? Um, you know, when is it serious enough? Also, how does this issue run up against, for instance, a principled commitment, a liberal commitment to the ideas of like rehabilitation, reintegration, restorative justice? It's all very complicated. And mm-hmm. we're going to talk about it at patreon.com slash feminine chaos. And, um, you know, if you are interested in hearing more of this conversation, then you can go over there. Absolutely. And, uh, you can, well, I was going to say, we'll see you, but we won't see see you when we see you (laughs) and you won't see us. We'll we'll be on the audio. Um, it's late. It's late here. It is. So, (laughs) um, but it's earlier in the Midwest. Yes, it is. Um, before we go, do you have anything else to say about coronavirus on college campuses or even about our original topic of, um, Molotov cocktail throwing 30 somethings who were nevertheless not old enough to know better? I think 30 somethings should hurl into college classrooms, little, like something shaped like a Molotov cocktail, but it actually prevents coronavirus. And that sounds really useful. And if that could be thrown everywhere, it would solve a lot of problems. Wow. I think I just invented the coronavirus cure slash vaccine. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm pretty proud of this. You should be. Pretty good for a humanities grad student turned whatever I am. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, coronavirus cure, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I put take it in, credit. Put it in your Twitter bio. And Definitely. this has been Feminine Chaos. Oh, Thanks yes, for joining absolutely. us. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>